people can do incredible things out of paper. I mean, if you just Google amazing origami and you'll see it, things that you do, you would you'd have a really hard time believing that that was made from a sheet of paper. <laughs> so there's something very simple about wisdom, something very profound about it. I think functions in programming um, have a lot of those properties, which makes them cool to study. So my goal tonight is that you all appreciate functions better, you'll understand them better, you'll use them better, maybe you'll use them more often, um, and ultimately that you'll achieve more in your code with less, less work, less code, less thought, less features, you know. Maybe you don't need all the, all the, like, you know, if you think about being an advanced Python programmer, you can think about that as being like, I know all the, you know, all the Python features, I know all the library features, but if you can use the features that you know about better, you may not need all that stuff. So, that's the goal tonight. So why, why functions? Why not objects, or classes, or variables? It's because functions are fundamental. There's something very fundamental about functions that's not true of other things. I didn't just pick functions because they're cool. I picked them because they're fundamental. If you removed every single feature from your language except functions, you would still be able to do everything. If all you had was functions, I mean no objects, no variables, no loops, no modules, nothing. You could still write every program that can be written. Um, might be a little harder, but you could do it. <laughs> and that actually, that language exists. It's called Lambda Calculus. And it is just as powerful as in terms of being able to write a program that can be written as the Turing machine, etc. Um, it's just as powerful as assembly. If you have, all you have is functions, you can write everything. Um, and so there's something interesting about functions. They're more, they're more discovered than they are invented. So they're, they're, instead of just being a tool like, oh, I need to hit something, I'll, I'll invent a hammer. Functions are almost a discovery. We like stumbled upon them and found how powerful they are. There's a, a very interesting um, sort of historical phenomenon called the Curry-Howard correspondence, which basically says that there are two guys who both invented, both, both discovered the same thing at different times. One was a logician and one was a, a programmer. And they discovered basically that logic and programming are in fact the exact same thing. They're, there's the exact same study. And that um, if, you, if you're trying to compare the two, in logic, you have propositions, and in programming, you have types. Those are, those are equivalent. And in logic, you have proofs, and in programming, you have functions. So if you, if you take those two things, they are, in fact, equivalent. Um, so it, even you may not think of yourself as a mathematician or as a very mathy person, but if you're programming, you are doing math. Um, you are doing logic. So just as an example, you can actually build numbers, booleans, lists, tuples, objects, everything, just out of functions. You don't even need numbers. <laughs> And because they're cool. That's my last reason. So what are functions? Now I know we have a huge swath of experience in this in this room. So how many people here like when I say function, you're like, I don't really know what that is. Okay. A couple people who are, who are like, I know exactly what that is, I use them all the time, I'm an expert. Would you like raise your hand? Okay. Even less. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Oh, I think this is a good talk, then, everyone. Um, so we'll start with we'll start with the basics. First of all, function actually has several meanings, and if you've ever been to a math class, you've heard the word function and you remember it, and it's essentially nothing more than just a mapping from an input to an output. It is often visualized as a graph, like here. At max equals i plus one. You could also represent it as an Excel spreadsheet. You know, if you had to, if you had to represent this as an Excel spreadsheet, that'd be a very large spreadsheet. One maps to two, two maps to three, three maps to four. Right? This is just plus one. Uh, this is a very succinct way of writing a function. F of x equals x plus one. Um, so you've learned about these in math. Um, there are certain rules in mathematical functions. That is, that every input must have one output. Output, not two outputs or some number of outputs. So, for example, you, I don't know if you remember learning this in algebra um, that you know the, a parabola is not a function. It's an equation, but it's not a function. Why? Because for 
the um, for x, yeah, if you pick if you pick some value of x, you'll have two y values that correspond to it. Um, actually, yeah. So it's often called the horizontal line test. Now, there's actually many types of functions. Um, there's injective. I'm not. This is not. A, you, know, you don't have to memorize this stuff. I mean, I have to look this up every time I want to. Know. Yes. I thought it was a vertical line from this second. You know what? I got it backwards. I just realized as I, as I was like, I think I got it backwards. It's vertical line test. Yeah, parabola. Um, it's vertical line test. You're absolutely right. I flipped it. Sorry about that. <laughs> See how much I remember uh, from my algebra. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's different types of functions. Um, there's injective, which is also called one to one, to one surjective, bijective. Um, these are just like different properties of functions. Like if you have a function, you can go, is it injective? No. Okay. Good to know. Yes. Okay. That means I know a little more about it, right? So it's like, do I have green paper, blue paper? You know, you know when you're making more comedy. It kind of tells you a little more about the function you're working with. Um, so another, another thing that you might, another more types of functions, there's partial functions. Partial functions are functions that um, are not defined for every input. So um, a good example would be one over x. Does anyone know what input is not defined for this function? Zero. Zero, right. Because one over zero, anything over zero is not defined. So f, this, in this case, f is um, partial. doesn't have a definition for zero. What about this second one, square root? Does anyone know? Zero. Negative. negative numbers, right. Any negative number, well, assuming the real, right, assuming real numbers, uh, negative numbers do not have a square root. So a total function is the opposite of that. It's a function that has, a, has an output for every single input that you could possibly give it. This is a great example, f of x equals x plus 1. We just saw that one. It's every single, um, there are no numbers you can pick here that won't have an output. So that's what you learn in math, except for my mistake. Um, in Python, you learn, you learn them a little differently. So here's the standard syntax for, for uh, you know, functions in Python, def, use the def keyword. Is it, who, has, who has not seen lambdas before? Okay, so this is, this is a very similar syntax, but it's a very similar thing, it's just a different syntax. Um, so we'll talk about the, just for anybody who's sort of new to Python, what exactly this is. So on the left we have this, the more traditional, this is like a traditional definition of a, of a function, def means defined. So defining a function, you give it a name, and then you give it a list of arguments. So x and y are two arguments that you might give to the function. And then you can have an optional doc string, which is in quotes right below, or triple quotes, depending on how you want to write it. And then you have a, a function body, which is just lines of code, and then you have a return statement, which is also optional. What happens if you don't return, have a return statement? What does it, what does it do? Return Returns none, right? Does what? Returns none. It adds. An, I'll, I'll show you. The, I'll give you an example. Uh, returns none. Uh, so lambda is a similar thing, although lambdas have a lot less stuff. Lambdas do not have names. They don't have doc strings. They do not have bodies. They only have return. So they have uh, arguments and return. That's it. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll get to this. I'll, I'll do a little more examples. Yeah. So how do you define it? How do you define it? How does it find the output for a given output input? I will, I will show you an example. Right here. <laughs> so when you're defining a function, you give it a name, so then you refer to it by name, right? So down here we have print f of 5, which is going to be 6, right? You can also give the, you can also pass the argument with its name. So you can say x equals 5. That's the same x, right? When you use lambdas, you don't have a name to use. You can't refer to them by name. So you actually, the way you use lambdas is you actually type the whole definition out right there, and then you call it. So in this case, this, this is kind of a silly example. You would never do this, right? But I'm just showing you how it works. So here you are actually defining the entire lambda, and on the right we pass it five. I'm just going to give us six. So lambdas are values, just like the number five is a value. You can toss them around and pass them. Um, it's a bit similar with f. You can do the same thing with f. It's a, it's a value. 
So there's some differences though in um, in Python functions. There's no rules like you have in math, right? There's no vertical line test on Python functions. The Python interpreter doesn't yell at you if you disobey the rules, right? You can still you can still write the function, it'll still run, and that happens all the time. You do all the time. So um, what about this function? Printing. Um, I don't know why I shouldn't be printing. I should be returning. Let's just pretend that it was returning. Um, if you um, returned, you know, the current times second, what can happen with this function? If you call it, let's say you call it seven times. Yeah, you can get different value for the exact same inputs, right? If you pass one, the first time you might get, you know, what if the current second? You know, it might be seven seconds. And if you pass it one again, you might get eight seconds this time. Right? So it gives you a different answer for the same inputs. So it's not a math function. Functions in Python can also have effects. This is a little more advanced, but you know, um, this, this function here looks really, if you were just call this function, oh, it's a very simple function, it gives me one more than the input, and happens to delete all of my files on my computer. <laughs> That's called an effect. You know, another great example of an effect is launch missiles. Right? You know, it, it looks innocuous when you call it, you have no idea that it's actually doing this, but it, it can do things, right? It can change files, it can download things from the internet, it can do things in the world that um, have an effect. That's why it's called effectful. Um, and so because of this, because Python doesn't have these rules, you have even more types of functions. You, all, you have all the same types of uh, functions you would have in no regular math, you still have injective, surjective, bijective, right, all that stuff. Uh, but you can also have pure functions, in, which are just like math. You can have impure functions, which like some of the ones we just saw. You can have deterministic functions, which are sort of both pure and uh, impure at the same time. And we're, I'll, I'll show you more about that later. And then you can, of course, have partial, total, etc. Um, before we get to here. Um, I wanted to show a couple of examples of things you can do with functions real quick. Um, can you guys see this? Okay, I'm going to use IPython for beginners. If you've, never, if you've ever, never used IPython, it is a very nice Python um, interpreter. It's, you'll see it as we're using it. It's much nicer than the default. So I wanted to show you real quick. You can ask for help. On any function, that's the doc string I showed you. So it can say help lend. You know, what, what does lend do? Oh, it returns the number of items in a container. That's cool. So if I define my um function, I can give it a doc string. <laughs> and I could say help f. So that's actually really just a really neat feature. You know, you can you can ask for help of any function. And it will tell you. And if you write that little string in there, then when you ask for help of your functions, it reminds you, oh, that's what that does, right? And also, we're going to talk about the default. Um, if you do nothing, if you don't have a return statement, right? This, this, see, this function I just defined has no return statement. The default is to return none. Well, see, it printed, let's see here, Max. So, if you do not put a return statement at the end of a def, then it will default to returning none. So all functions return something in Python. Actually, that's not true. Uh, almost all functions in Python return none. Um, and then I think there was one other question for the follow-up I wanted to answer. Um, oh, lambda, that's right. So lambda, this is some, it's like, it's, you're just passing it around. So this is a function, you can do this though, right? It's a value, so I, I just gave it a name, and it's not actually its name, like it's not actually named f, I just, I created a variable called f, which holds a function. So if I call it, it says, so this is very similar to using def, although if I do help on f, now, it's like, I don't know what this is, it's a lambda. <laughs> uh, you can actually fix that. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Hmm. Uh, I just did this. This. Maybe you have to put a name on it. Oh, Is it a dolphin? What's that? Is it a double underscore? Oh, no, I, I missed that. It's not help, it's doc. I don't know why that font is so terrible. <laughs> um, it's F underscore doc. There's one more underscore there. You can, but you can, you can kind of like build it back up and get yourself back to where you left off without with the lambda. So you, know, so you could define, um, you know, main docs. So now you could do something like <laughs> so you can kind of get it back if you cheat a little bit. But that's more of a trick. <laughs> Don't do this in real life. Uh, but I just since we're talking about lambdas. Alright. So, um, where are we, where are we? so a little pop quiz, also slash learning. I'll teach you guys some things here. Is this function pure? Which of the two? Is it pure or deterministic? I'm assuming you know the answer, that you know what those things are. If you don't, we'll learn. You know, if it's, it's, it's either pure, I know it's either pure or deterministic. You know which one? It's deterministic. <laughs> it is not pure. Why? It has an effect, it prints. It's not pure, so it's not like a math function, but it does, but what is? what about the answer? The answer is always completely determined by the input. So if you just got rid of that print, it would be pure, right? So if you just get rid of the effects in a function, it's, it's called deterministic. Deterministic means it's complete, the output is completely determined by the inputs. This is, a, this is a very useful property, especially in concurrency. If that print was like, you know, launch missiles and you accidentally have to run it two threads. Oops, I you launched two missiles, right? So this this is a very useful property to know about. So even though it has effects, it's still deterministic. That's why I say it's sort of a hybrid between effectful and pure. Um, if you remember, so injective, I'll remind you injective. Injective means that every, uh, so the, the rule of functions is that every input has one output. If it's an injective, that means every output has one input. So it's one to one. Basically, means you can kind of go back and forth. So does anyone know if this is injective or not? Yes. Yes, it is injective. How would if you if if I if the string was hello Bob, could you deduce the input to be something? Yes, it's Bob. The input was Bob. It couldn't be anything else, right? Because you always put hello in front of it. So this is injective. Um, so. This, I'm not expecting you guys to memorize this stuff. It's just being aware that, they, that these concepts exist is sort of what, what I'm going for here. Because if you are aware that they exist, then you'll know that you can look them up later. Right? You'll know that, oh, there's a thing out there that talks about this. I don't know, oh, we'll Google it. Right? And eventually you'll find it again. Oh, that's what it was. Um, is this function total or partial? It is partial. Why? <laughs> it never returns. It never returns. That's why I say this function. That's why I said almost all functions return a value in Python. This function does not. It never returns. Yes. This is something I kind of don't understand. Is so what is x? Oh, this is x. So x is an argument. Oh. So here x is an argument to the function, um, which means. So we're adding one to what? Oh yeah. So x plus plus equals means take the variable on the left and add one to it. But what would that be here? What is x? So x is any. Oh, yeah, x is whatever you want to be when you call the function. So, if, you know, if we had this function, let's, let's, 
Yeah. Yeah. You got it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We can come back around. I'm not sure how long my talk is. I haven't gone all the way through it yet. Actually, she'd make a pretty good uh, error checker. You know, that's not defined. So. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, we can come back to these things. I have some, you know, Q&A at the end. You guys can, um, we, can go, we can dive into any of these things deeper. Uh, all right. So this function never returns, therefore it's partial. Um, that's good. That's just sort of it's good to know. Now, is this function stolen from XKCD <laughs> pure, deterministic, or effectful? It's pure. It is pure. Yes, it is pure. Yes. <laughs> The reason I chose this though is because it's a funny joke. What if this actually did return a, num a random number? Actually, would it be pure deterministic or effective? Pure. It's effectful, yes. Rand randomness is not pure or deterministic. If it was, it wouldn't be random. Randomness is actually effectful because in order to get a random number, you have to pick some number out of, the, out of some ether and then tell that ether, okay, now I'm ready for the next one, which means every time you run it, you'll get a different answer. So randomness is something you have to be really careful with, with functions. You shouldn't just throw randomness anywhere you want because that suddenly, any, if you just throw randomness in a function, you are now no longer pure or deterministic. You are. So if you, if you had something that was like really clean and nappy and pure, and you throw, you know, get random int in it, boom, gone. We lost all those properties. Now you just have some random thing that's exactly random. Uh, now, of course, you can't talk about functions without talking about recursion. Um, recursion, does anyone, uh, who, who doesn't know what recursion is? Does anyone not know what it is at all? Okay. Has anyone ever like looked in the mirror and had a mirror behind you? Right? That's recursion. So the mirror behind you reflects like a little bit, and if you just like stand at a weird angle, you can like see like a thousand of your heads, you know? You're like, oh, that's what that was. <laughs> um, that's recursion. Recursion is sort of self-reference. So uh, a classic recursive function is quicksort. I'm not gonna go through how quicksort actually works. Um, but you notice that we are defining a function called quicksort, and then in the body of the function, look, there's two places where quicksort is called. So we have a function called quicksort, and inside the function, we are calling the same function. So this function is calling itself. So it's a function that's, that's calling itself. And this would produce an infinite loop if it weren't for the if. The if is very important here, it's called the base case. It just says, you know, if, if the length of our input is less than equal to one, we do not call ourselves. So what's happening? At this, you know, generally, usually the way recursion usually works, you give some list, and then it takes one off the list and calls itself with one less, and eventually the list kind of gets down to nothing, right? And then it kind of builds back up. So it it works. It's um, it kind of takes the place of loops a lot of times. And for certain algorithms, it's a lot easier uh, to write recursively, like walking through a directory tree or something. But usually, using loops is actually easier to use. I'm just, you have to be aware that recursion exists. Um, rec recursion with lambdas is a little more interesting because uh, lambdas don't have a name. So remember, recursion is self reference, it's when you refer to yourself. But lambdas don't have a name, so how can they refer to themselves? So, do you, is, is it possible? It's possible. <laughs> there is something called the Y Combinator. Has, has anyone ever read, you know, Hacker News? Where do you think they got that name from? The Y Combinator. This is, in fact, the Y Combinator in Python. Don't ever use this. Terrible idea. But uh, anytime you're using recursion, you're fundamentally using this idea. Um, I have no idea how this actually works. I mean, I've looked at it, but it's, it's very tricky. This is why I say it's like origami. Look, at there's only lambdas in this thing. That's it. 
just a bunch of lambdas. But this, this defines recursion with just lambdas. Um, it's like, oh God. So in this case, uh, I have a quick sort, the same quick sort, but without, <clears throat> a, name, without uh, a name for itself. So I can actually show you this real quick. So first we'll run, so here's quick sort. Standard definition. It refers to itself. You see that? So here's the definition, and it refers to itself. So if I call it with some list, yeah. Oh wait, it's already sorted. That sorts now. That can that can that can call itself. This uh, this is sort of cheating as I gave this name. But just to show you that that it can work, you can use the Y combinator, and uh, which gives you a function. That's a function, and then if you give it. Uh, some input. It also works. We're just proving that it works. Uh, it's, for those who are just like interested in, in, in have the mental capacity to even think about this for two seconds, it actually gives it this, it, uh, the Y counter like sort of gives you a name to work with by passing you yourself as an argument. <laughs> but um, that's why I say it's very much like, this, is, this just feels like origami every time I'm doing it. It's like, so now you take the paper and you flip it backwards and all of a sudden you have a crane. <laughs> you know. Um, all right. So it does it does work. Now, um, just a little bit of trivia and backward, very interesting information. What kind of was discovered by a guy named Haskell Curry? Um, it represents Curry's paradox. And what he did with this is he actually represented how, he actually used this to prove that lambda calculus is unsound. You can prove anything. You can prove false is true. Uh, in fact, you can do any train complete language um, with with these paradoxes. And this is where type systems were came from. They were invented to solve this problem, to make uh, programming sound again. Don't worry, you don't have to worry about that. But it's just sort of true. Now, one thing about recursion I'll tell you is that Python is not very good at recursion. Has it has something called the recursion limit, which means if you call yourself like I think it's like a hundred thousand times, Python will throw an exception. Like, sorry, it was a lot. It's also terrible memory usage. It'll eat up all your memory. You shouldn't. You just probably should just avoid recursion in Python generally. Um, unless, of course, you're using Snapless Python. If you don't know what that is, then don't worry about it. Um, so instead of using recursion, you should use loop more functions instead. You could use loops, but instead you should use more functions. So now we'll talk about how to do that. <coughs> Higher order functions. Who knows, who knows what that is? I've got some people who are like, oh, it's, it, it's so much fun. <laughs> it's amazing. It's very much like Morgami, isn't it? It's like, yeah. How did you do that? Okay. So higher functions are functions that take functions as arguments. This is where lambdas become much more useful. Um, functions that take functions or produce functions as outputs. Uh, both the y combinator took a function and produced a function as, a, as an input and output. So it is very high order. Um, so the classic example of a higher function is like the map function. The map function is very much like a loop. You give it some input, like a list. And it takes a function and it maps the function on all the elements of the loop and gives you a new uh, uh, elements of the list, gives you a new function at the loop <coughs> if that function applies. And then filters are very similar. I'll just run this so you can get, get an idea of what this does. Um, so let's use the map function. Um, what do we want to do? We want to take, let's say, we're going to take a range of just 10 numbers, first 10 numbers. We're gonna add, make a new. So let's let's start from the beginning. What does range ten do? Zero, one, two, three, four, nine. That's the input. Okay. So that's the input. Now let's take that and map lambda x x. 
Oh yeah, these return iterators. Just put this to the front. So what's, in, what's different about these lists? Yeah, in the second list, every number is one more than the last one in the first list. Why is that? Because we mapped plus one to all of them. What did the map return the first before you took the list? <clears throat> Your second to last one. What did the map return? Uh, second to last. Oh. Before you wrapped it. Oh, before I left it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> this is not. This talk is not about iterators. It returns an iterator, which um, is just a really fancy list. <laughs> it's a really fancy list. It's based. Yeah. If you ever get something like that, like map object or something, you can just put list in front of it. Range itself is an iterator, actually. So if you type range, actually, it's technically not an iterator, but uh, it is very similar to an iterator. So if you type range, it doesn't actually print you zero through one, zero, zero through nine. It tells you, I'm a range between zero and nine. You have to use list to actually get all the numbers. So did Matt return that iterator because you fed it an iterator or because Matt did? Map always returns an iterator. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So if you if you have a, a dictionary and you need to iterate over items in the dictionary, you can you can do that. You so, can do that. Yeah. Although um, I should probably mention that this is the exact same thing as a list comprehension. Who's does anyone not know? Does anyone know what a list comprehension is? List comprehension? No, I don't know. Okay, this, it's, exact, it's the exact same idea, but Python has built-in syntax for it, so I'll write it down. Um, instead of, I could say x plus 1 for x in range 10. So this is the exact same thing. It just has built-in syntax. So if you type brackets, square brackets, and then you type some expression for x in range, for x in something. So this is this is no, this is this range here is this range. This x is this x, and then this x plus one is this x plus one up here. It's the exact same thing. Why would you use that? Uh, you probably wouldn't actually. You probably would not use map instead of a list comprehension because it's more just longer and it's like more annoying to look at. But the reason I'm talking about map is because it's a higher order function, <laughs> not because it's necessarily the more syntactically friendly way of doing it. Um, so map is a higher order function because it, one of its arguments is a function, right? One of its arguments is itself a function. It doesn't just take lists, it takes functions. So map is a higher order function because it takes a function. Um, but yes, you can use list comprehensions. You can also use generator comprehensions, which are like even more fancy. Well, the only difference is you use uh, uh, parentheses instead. This is not talking about this, but I'm talking about it. <laughs> so you can actually just do that. It's even better. Um, nice thing about comp yeah. Anyway. Iterators and generators are very important. I, I, I think <coughs> generators are Python's best feature. They're Python's best feature. Um, so they're really cool. Other than functions, of course. What you need to do anything. Um, when you say sorry, a generator is its best function, you're saying like range is a generator? Range is, is like, very much like a generator. Gen I, said, I said generators are Python's best feature. Python has, this is, this is not a feature of every language. Like C++ doesn't have generators. Um, but Python does. So it's a cool feature. Definitely learn more about it. <laughs> another talk. Another talk for another time, yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't we just have a talk about them? Didn't, Nick, a few months ago? Maybe, I can't remember now. All right. Possibility. So yeah, mapping, this is, this is the same as a map, it's just that this is built in syntax. You don't need the built-in syntax because you can do it with map, but hey, it's got built-in syntax, it looks nice to use it. You can also, so filter is very similar, so if you filter, so instead of taking a function that transforms the input, 
you're taking, you're taking a function that decides if you want it, right? It's a, it's a filter. So if you have x, you could say x less than 5, for example. Does anyone give me a wild guess what this is going to return? Yeah, so this filters out um, all the things after 5. So you can, but uh, you could also do something like a new mod. Yeah, these are all the even numbers. This just this takes the input, throws away the ones where they're not even, and just gives you back the ones that are even. All right? Um, here's all the odd. Whoops. Here's all the odd ones. So, filter is useful. You often use them together. Um, once again, list comprehensions actually have this built in because you can do this after I figure out where that line was. If, was it just if? It was just if. So you can do if x less than 5. So you can do this with list, comp with list comprehensions as well. It's the exact same thing. Um, well, the nice thing about list comprehensions here is I did the filter and the map in one line, like in one thing. Yeah? One thing um, I just wanted to bring up, the if statement was applied before you did the x plus 1 on that function, so it's still printed out in 5. Right. Exactly right, yes. The if applies to the x that you're looping over, not the one that you've decided to put in the result. Yes, very important. You can also do nest. Uh, you can do um, you can do nested fours for x in range for y. This is going to be a lot of numbers. Let's pick five instead. Um, this is all the pairs. Every single pair of one through five. This is a nested loop. Effectively, mm -hmm. I should pick a much smaller number. Let's just do like two. So you can nest them. So you can you can um, do nested loops this way. So this is zero 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 one one zero one one. All the possible permutations of two numbers between zero and two. Um, yeah. So those comprehensions are cool. I learned about them. <laughs> uh, this, uh, yeah. So filter. You saw what filter did. That's, those are higher functions. All right, let's see. Yeah, so I, I already said a lot of what I wanted to say on this slide. But uh, one thing that's really interesting about these generators, the generators we're talking about, is they make they make uh, higher order functions like this actually useful. If it worked for iterators, then these would be just tremendously slow to use because you loop through the list many times every time you use one of these things, but inverters allow us to do it in uh, one pass. Anyway, it just makes it more, makes it fast, is the point. Um, so, but if anyone's familiar with SQL, you can think of map as select, right? Who, who knows SQL? Now, lots of people. You have all done this before, <laughs> right? So, select, you're, you're selecting what? Something out of the database. That's your map function. You're mapping some, you know, transformation. You can, you can do select, you know, name, um, age plus one out of from table dot age, right? So you can you can add something to all of the ages and get the answer. So that's that's map is the equivalent to select. And filter is obviously the where clause, right? So you can this is stuff that SQL has built in. Um, the, another very common parameter function is a reducer, also known as a fold. This Python does not have built-in syntax for, so you have to use the parameter function. Um, so this one is a little tricky. This is very much like SQL aggregate functions. You know, if you were to use sum, you know, like select sum, you know, expenses from you know, amount from expenses. Right? It gives me the, all the sum of all the expenses in the entire table. So um, reducers, they do not. Um, I, I just got to run this one. This is too trippy. To like, uh, Assume that you'll just get it by looking at it. Um, so, so all the things we've seen before, so far, they work like per element. So if you have, if, you have, if your input is ten, then your map 
will also have 10 items. Sorry, if your input has 10 items, your map will have 10 items. If your input has 10 items, your filter will filter over 10 items. Reducers let you sort of squish them all together if you want to. Um, so in a good example, let's, write, let's like talk about the sum function. Um, if you want to sum a bunch of numbers, <coughs> let's say you want to sum all the numbers between 1 and 4, right? So you could do this with a loop, right? You could do, you know, 4 i in, oh wait, I gotta start with this, you know, total equals 0, and then, you know, 4 i in items plus equal i is total now. So you could use a loop for this. Um, but if you think about this sort of like step out of the programming mock bubble for a second, what if you could like turn all of these commas into plus signs? Just like do like a regex. And what if you just did that? That is sort of more obvious to like, if, if you're an experienced programmer, you're going to say, no, it's not. Okay, if you're not an experienced programmer, that is a lot more obvious, right? If you want to sum all the numbers between 1 and 10, you just put a plus in between all the numbers, <laughs> and you sum them, right? That's what you do. This is the idea behind reducers. Or, um, so if you, would, if you use reduce, which is not available in the standard library by default, actually it is. Uh, from from tools produce. What this lets you do is it lets you give it a function, and the function is the function that's going to stick in between all the items. So if you have a list, one, two, three, four, you basically want to say this. You want, this is what you want to say. I want to say, take that list, replace all the commas with pluses, and do that and give you the answer. Right? You can't do that in Python. You can't just say plus like that. What you can do is write it out really verbosely. Right? Give it a function with two arguments, add them together. That's the same idea. Ten. So that's the idea behind a reducer. You give it a function, which is the squisher function. It's a squisher, I call it. And it sticks it between all things, and then here's the answer. Yes? Excuse my language terms, but if you're such a high order command, such as, I don't know, like a number of numbers, and Use range here instead? Is that you're asking? Can I use like uh in the additive feature? Like that? Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Is that the shortest way to do that? Uh so you can do even shorter, I think. It defaults to zero as the first. Yeah. Yeah, you can I'm writing it out sort of explicitly so you see the commas. Right. But yeah, you can just do it this way. <clears throat> but reduce is a way of picking which function or which thing you want to you know, replace as commas in the list. Um, again, just use the sum function, like if you're actually doing this. <laughs> it's built in. But let's say you didn't want to use plus and you wanted to use something else. Like maybe you wanted to use Now you want to like, you know, for some reason you had a list of bools. Ah, sorry. Switching languages every day. Yeah, that's true. If you end together true, true, and false, you get false. Because true and true is true, and true is and true, and true and false is false. So this is a way of ending together all the things in a list in order. So of course now, oh, I want to switch it to or? Easy peasy. Right? So you could use a loop to do that, but why? 
It's so easy. Um, you can do really, really interesting things with reduce. In fact, you can do anything you can do with a loop with a reduce. Uh, in fact, you can write map with reduce, and you can write filter with reduce. Those other two functions we learned about, you can do them with this function. Um, so this is a way of thinking about functions, sort of not not thinking about steps in a program, but thinking about transformations. Like it's, a, it's like a bigger idea. Uh, all right, so. Reduce is useful, and, and the reason I say before I was talking about like loops are so for those who are interested in performance, loops are fast in Python. Um, so if you were using like recursion or something just crazy slow, reduce of course is, is, is written in terms of a loop, so you still get speed. You just not you don't have to talk about the loop directly. Um, okay, that's, sorry, I'm gonna get ahead of myself, but you know why not just use a loop? Well. You will, if you use a reduce anywhere ever, somebody will go, that's not Pythonic. Somebody out there, they'll, they'll say that no matter what you do, but somebody will definitely say that about your reduce. And um, that's probably true for some definition of Pythonic. Um, you know, it's all, this, this is the actual definition that's it's equivalent to the reduce I gave you. It's a lot longer. Um, this is the one that works with iterators. Um, but also, statements in Python are not first class. For loops are not first class, which means you can't pass them around. You cannot pick up a for loop and hand it to somebody else. For, uh, reduce is a expression, which means you can pick it up and hand it to somebody else. Um, which is the, like that's the difference between def and lambda as well. Def is a <coughs> syntactical thing. It's not a um, expression. It's a statement. You cannot pick up def and hand it around. Um, but you can do it with lambdas. So, uh, next we're going to talk about closures. I could not find a meme about closures. I tried. So, that's what you get. <laughs> um, not to be confused, the language called closure with a J. Um, this is actually, you probably use this more often than you realize in Python. <coughs> you don't realize that you're doing it. Closure just means that if there's some, okay, there's a variable outside of the function called total, right? And then inside of the function you're using it, that's a closure. It just means that your function is closing over some variable that was defined outside of it. That's a, it's, uh, it's so boring you don't even have what we're ever talking about. Um, so, some nitty gritty details though. In Python 2, those, uh, well, those uh, closures are shallow copied, which means they're read only. Um, and, well, that's not, that's not what they mean, but you know. And then Python 3 has a new um, keyword that lets you sort of not make them copied. So, I was going to show an example here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that slide is not good. So, with closures though, what's interesting is you can actually make Classes out of functions using closures. So, not that you should ever do this. Note, note, never do this. But I'm just showing you that functions are so powerful. Like you don't realize how much power there is. You think, oh, you know, Python's object oriented. It has all these object oriented things. Well, guess what? If you had functions, you could do it too. You could still be object oriented with just functions. Which is kind of like backwards. But um, so I have this written up here somewhere. Where is it? Okay, so here's my constructor, my init, my dunder init. It takes an argument and I define something called self. Ignore this, please. It's a hack. Um, and then I'm defining all the methods. Here are the methods. Here's a function. Here's a method. Then I return a dictionary that's all the uh, all the methods of this object. So I can do init. You know, let's start with five. Uh, wait, I gotta give it something. Again. Object. <laughs> uh, I'm going to see get total. This, this is a terrible syntax. It looks terrible, but it works. So I can get the total. I can set the total. Set it to six. Not six. So it's an object. It's a little bit ugly object, but it's an object. You know? Kind of. Kind of like it a little bit. So you're like, well, it doesn't have inheritance. Oh, but you can get it back. 
Do I come in? <laughs> you can. Um, yeah, like I said, don't, don't do this. I'm just making a point. So now I've sort of, um, so now I've talked about all the like things that function, like all the like mechanics of functions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what is closure? Yeah, yeah, I can go there. I can talk about it. It's a, it's a name. It's a name for the most boring thing ever. Um, <laughs> it's just a name for this idea that <sighs> it's a name because C doesn't have it. C doesn't have this. It's the only language. Doesn't have this. PHP. What? PHP doesn't have closure. Doesn't have binds though. You can you can explicitly. You can use the use statement to pass in variables to the scope of closure, but it doesn't have closure. Okay, you might be technically right on this one. <laughs> That's right. You you can you can use you can <laughs> use the uh, can you use the, yeah, you can use the uses thing right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can like construct them manually. Yeah. C++ has that too. That's close enough. But yeah, you're right. It's not technically appropriate. Okay, so... What is it? All right, so closure is... Um, let's, let's write a C function. Right? You don't know C, but this is easy. Oh, maybe you do. This is easy enough to read. And so up here, you know, you have. Um, oh, actually, I'm thinking of. This is going to be a global. Anyway, you can't. You can't do this in C. So I'm, I'm writing a. I'm writing a main function. Um, and then inside of here, I've got you know int, you know. You know, uh, success or something, right? Equals zero, and then in here I want to, you know, you know, success equals false or no zero. Okay. So then I want to return. If, you know, you you can actually return functions in C, but this function has no idea that this variable exists. This variable is like, what? What are you talking about? Success. This is that's why I say it's so boring. You look at this code and you're like, wait, why would it why would it not know what success is? Yeah, why wouldn't it know? I don't know. Some languages don't have that feature, but Python does. So, yay! But um, the idea is this function, Python. Let's convert this to Python now. That's not valid C, by the way. <coughs> So I'm, you know, and then success equals one. So here, this function does actually know about this variable called success. I should not use the mutation, but let's do print instead. Uh, so if, I, if you run this, you, you know, I, we can run this. Let's just run it. There you go. Don't say if, but you can do it. So, let's see here. I think I have to close this. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yes. That's not valid Python. Main. So main gives me a function. I can call. Well, main is a function. Main gives me a function. I can call that function. It's going to print. Ah! What happened? Oh. Oh goodness! Oh, I forgot to pass an x. Okay, so it printed zero. That's because this inner function knows about this variable called success, which was defined outside of the function. Make sense? Yes. So it's, it's it's called a closure because this inner function is closing over this variable, and you could kind of think of it like this is like a plant, and when you pull the plant, the roots come with it, right? 
right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, it's pulling more things with it. You, know, you, you can't get this function without also getting this variable along with it. That's all it is. That's why it's called closure V. Um, the fact is, you probably aren't going to be thinking about them, which is why they're so boring. But they're very important. If, if without closures, then a lot of your code would just like stop, stop working, and you'd be like, why? <clears throat> all right. So the last fold of the origami paper we got to talk about is this is the first time we're really talking about the fold of origami paper. This is all I've been telling you up now is like how paper works. You know, like how paper, like what shape it is. This is actually how to fold it. This is a really, really, really powerful idea, but it's so simple. It's the idea of composition. Does any remember, anyone remember the fog thing from math? Fog. I don't know why it's that little circle G. Um, <clears throat> that is the composition operator. It is equal to if you take F composed with G and then give it x, that's the same thing as if you just call g with x and then call it f with that. So it, it's sort of like, uh, it's actually very much like bash. Who's, who's used bash? Okay, not very many people. You guys like use windows or something? Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so for those of you who use bash, you know, this is, you know, this is the grep example you were talking about earlier. In bash, you can echo high. You can then echo high, let's see, echo... Grep is a bad example here. Let's open a file. Right now. Okay. So this is our file. It's a file. So now we can grep that file for is, right? So you're sort of taking the output and just piping it through, like, and then you can like do more things, like grep again. So now we took took the whole file. We kind of sucked it into this thing, which only tells us the lines that have is in them. And that gave us this other thing. And then we can do it again and only tell us the lines that have th in them, right? This is composition. Each one of these things is a function, has an input, has an output. And you can see, you can kind of imagine the data moving from left to right, right? You kind of imagine it. It's like moving like a water through a pipe. So this is the idea of composition in here. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way this is defined, it's actually backwards. It moves from right to left, but <clears throat> um, you can get past that. So this is, if you have two functions, grep and another grep maybe, um, you can kind of stick them together and create another function, which is the combination of the two, right? That's like if you had just this, just these two here, you can actually uh, yeah, so these, these two combined are really just one grep, right? These two combined are the equivalent of one grep, which is, you know, searching for that, right? If you take these two, they're sort of, they can kind of squish them together and make one. That's the idea of composition. You're taking multiple things and squishing them together. Um, so you can write this function in Python. It's not very impressive. This arcs, quark stuff. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. <coughs> but this is just like the proper way to write a really generic function in Python. Um, so what this lets you do, though, is you can write really cool stuff. It's a super idea, a super, super simple idea. Like you can say, um, let's say you had a compose function which takes a bunch of functions and just sticks them in line, like 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 bash piping. You can say, well, give me, I'm going to define a pipeline which um, takes some CSV data, and I'm going back, this goes backwards, so it starts from the bottom. Uh, map, we're going to lowercase the last name, then we're going to filter all the eye colors to only those who have blue eyes, then we're going to sort by last name and take the top 20. You cannot, I mean, that's about as succinct as you could possibly have said that, right? This code is super succinct. It says exactly what you mean. I want 
the lowercase last names, blue eyes, sort of a last name, top 20. Top 20 based on sort of last name. Discounting case, right? So this is an extremely succinct way of saying something, and we've achieved it by just using functions. No fancy, you know, Pi libraries or anything. And what's also cool is the pipeline itself is a value. You could, you could write, you know, you could have different, like, you could have a hundred different pipelines and just pass them around. So this compose, in fact, this compose will let you compose two pipelines together. If you had two separate pipelines, you could just stick them together, and now you have two pipelines that go, you know, one after the other. So anyone who's doing like data analysis, you're working with lots and lots of data, this is a really powerful idea for you in doing like um, you know, data analysis. So, and then um, other ideas you can use. This, you can use the same idea for like writing input validation on your forms, using parsing. If you want to parse data, which is very similar to that, you can write formatting rules for like HTML or whatever. You can actually write a query language generator for this. It's just the sky is the limit. This is you know now go and fold and make things like amazing. Um, here's where I was gonna let people like soak this in and, and ask questions. Um, if you want me to like write some examples, some good examples, I can do that. Um, I have a feeling your brains are either like completely lost or about to explode. So, um, but I have an ex I have some examples ready to go if you want to look at them or if you have questions or want to dive into something deeper, real quick. Yeah. So the idea of composition, you use a function called compose. Mm -hmm. but are you saying that like? Any function is essentially composition. Like if you're, if you've got each line in its best written form is telling you to do exactly one thing, and you're putting it all together to be able to replicate that later, is that what you're saying composition is? Um, composition is just the idea of composing things. So it's just taking two things and putting them together. It's like Legos. Legos are really compositional. You know, sand is not. Like, you can put it together, but it doesn't hold any shape. Right? If you have, like, oh, hi, look, I have two buckets of sand. Great. Compose them. Now you have a bigger bucket of sand. You know, like, but with Legos, it's like, now you have two Legos, you have four Legos, now you have a wall. I can take two walls. I have a tall wall or a wide wall, right? You can, like, you can, with, with composition, you can just keep building, and it never stops. It never, like, breaks down. So you're right that every function has some compositional properties, but um, <clears throat> some functions are much better at composition than others. That is true. Yes? Is there a reason for the underscore after like what happened both are here? Uh, yes, because uh, the built-in math and filters require two arguments, and I'm only giving them one. So this is assuming I made, <clears throat> this doesn't actually work. I don't have code for this, but I'm trying to make you not, this is not the built-in filter. It's a slightly variant that I made, okay. almost the same. Um, what's interesting is uh, functions that are pure and deterministic are much, much better at composing than functions that, that have effects. Uh, like if you if you try to compose things that are like deleting files and stuff, you're, you're going to delete all the files. <laughs> it's not going to be good. It's not going to be pretty. <laughs> so writing functions that are very simple, that you know, are deterministic or pure, they work really well in this environment. They they just they don't get in your way. They're always they always give you what you expect. I did a part of the reason I gave this talk is because a long time ago. I gave a talk that I'm pretty sure everyone just like their eyes glazed over. But um, but this repository has some code. It is this is an example of we wrote this in the talk, which is why I think people's eyes glazed over. <laughs> this is a parser for JSON written exclusively in terms of functions. And a tuple, one tuple. All functions, but it's a parser for JSON, right? So I don't know if 
if you know what JSON is, right, imagine you're given the task to write a parser for it. You might lose sleep. Like, that's hard. This is doing it with just functions, and we did it in the course of an hour during your talk. So you don't need cool, special Python features to write parsers. You can just use functions. Um, and you'll see at the very end, this is, this is the definition of my parser. A value is uh, either a string, an integer, or a dictionary. And a string is a double-quoted text, which is many of which is many characters that are not double quotes. <laughs> right? This is very. Like, I'm reading this to you, but this is the definition of a parser. A string is a double-quoted piece of text that contains many characters that are not double quotes. Um, so these are all just functions. This is an example of. Uh, a thing which was written using just functions, but it's extremely powerful. You can parse any JSON this way. You can write a parser for something else. Um, the example I sort of had set up is like a really simple example. Does anyone, who, does anyone know what HTML is? Right? It's websites. Right. Everyone used Jinja? You know, templates? Well, like, what if you, you know, didn't have Jinja for some reason? You know, like, ah, crap, I'm going to make some HTML, you know, look nice or write it. Well, you can actually write your own HTML templating language in, like, mm, you know, seven lines. Um, here is a tag. A tag takes a name, so it's like HTML, or the P tag, or the I tag, or the M tag, whatever. <clears throat> takes a body, takes some, argument, uh, takes some uh, attributes. And it just generates a string, which puts the name at the beginning, the name at the end, puts the attributes in here, and puts the body in the middle. And I can say, well, HTML is a tag with HTML, P is a tag with P, OL is an ordered list, which is <coughs> the LI tag mapped over some list. Oh, and I'm using Compose here. That's cool. But let's, uh, it's like HTML. Text. What does this produce? What about HTML P text? So I just generated a really tiny, like, powerful HTML for my library. But I can also do arguments like P, you know, class. Oh, you can't. You can't do class in this, can you? You do class. Does Python hate me for this? Yeah, that's what I thought. Python. It's a cheer way of doing it. Oh dear. Oh yeah. P class equals test. Um, you'd probably write a function to make that a little prettier. And then let's say you want to like, oh, now I want to write an A tag. Well, I don't have, I'm just going to do it. Just, now I can do like um, P plus A ref. Oh, wait. Click me. Ref equals. There we go. Look at that. So now we have. HTML with a P tag and a, an A tag with a ref. It says, click me, click me. And I did this with this much, with this, with this, with four lines. <laughs> with four lines, you can generate HTML very prettily. So we're, um, and you can make this nicer. I mean, like this plus here might be a little annoying. You can take negative like, text or something. But you get the idea. With very little, we have achieved very much. <laughs> And you can't even get your tags wrong. It always gets the tags right. It always has the magic tag at the end. So, just a powerful idea, just by using functions. Here's that map I defined. Um, I uh, had on the screen earlier. Anybody want more examples, ID questions, complaints, objections? Well, I was curious about a couple of things as far as uh, time 
that it takes for execution or something like has have you run any like big O on this to see what is uh, more efficient time wise, especially when you're dealing with uh, large data tables and, and things like that. So your big O is going to be the same as some other language or some other thing, except that your constant factors are going to be a lot worse because Python has a lot of overhead for calling functions. So yes, it's true that if you use a lot of functions in Python, it's going to be slower than if you wrote everything in a terrible, hard to read way. <laughs> okay. But that's always true. If it looks terrible and it's hard to read, then it's probably faster. <laughs> if you write it like this, it's probably going to be slower, but you might actually have a clue what it's doing. And the other question that I had was as far as um, speaking of being Pythonic yeah. for things, uh, how does this go along with explicit versus implicit? Yeah. Uh, what is it? Forgot it. I forgot the the how to get the uh, the Zen. Oh, you heard this. Thank you. Yeah. How to uh, explicit versus implicit? Um. So that's interesting. I, I, I would have imagined you would pick. Any number of these, you know, Zen rules, but I didn't think that was the first one that, that I thought of. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah. it definitely applies to this. Yeah. Functions are simple at their heart, right? There's, there's nothing complicated about these functions. It might be like hard for you to like realize how all the folds work, right, in the origami, but fundamentally, it's simple. Um, so that's one rule. Um, explicit is better than implicit. I'm trying to think how it applies to that. No mysterious side effects. Yeah, if you're okay. Yeah, if you're avoiding side effects like we're doing here, that is definitely better. Like you're, there's no uh, hidden effects. But yeah, in Python you can do them. You just you should be careful about them. It's and you know this is not me. Bashing it at all is genuinely curiosity. Oh yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right to question. I mean, and, you know, if you're a Python programmer at a company who writes Python, do not just like walk in there and be like, ha ha, I know some cool things, and I'm gonna rewrite all your code now. You know, like um, being like other people and like making your code look like theirs is extremely valuable. <laughs> Even if their code doesn't look anything like this, right? But this is just a way for you to like appreciate something better, so that when the opportunity arises, you can maybe use that in your favorite code. Um, so any other questions? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your thought process when you come up against uh, something you want to do about deciding whether you want to go this route or use some other loops? process. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, why like why would you use this instead of loops or something? How do you how do you decide when you're when you're looking at, at a computation that you're going to create? How do you decide which pattern you use? Is yeah. This, this or something else? Not necessarily loops, but um, that's a tough one. Uh, let's see, I, I've done this so much now that it's almost like immediately think of this way, which is probably not true of most Python programmers. They're going to go, like, for them to think of a, a function-based solution is going to be foreign. So rule number one, whatever comes to mind first, if it works, you do it. Okay. What, what experience brought you this path? Is it, oh, okay. Was, that's, that's was it question. other languages? Was it other non-computing things that sort of shape your thinking in this way? Um, I think it's things like this. Have you ever tried to write a parser in like just kind of, I'm going to write a parser today and 
what you end up with is almost always something you're like, oh, never, oh, ugh. like it's just, it's vomitrocious. It's like one of vomit when you see it, right? And then you, and then you like talk to some guy and he's like, oh yeah, I wrote a password in like 20 lines. He like shows you this. It's like, oh, it's a tuple, which is the, you know, three tuples. It was like, like, really? How did you do that? And it's just, this. I think seeing this for other people, you know, this is, this is not my idea, right? Right. <laughs> you know, some other people showed me this, and I was like, man, that's, um, that's about as succinct and like as clear. You know, they, we always a good example is we always talk about if your if your code needs a ton of documentation, like comments, your code's probably not very good. Not knocking docs, but if your code needs you to like sit there and be like, okay. <laughs> Ignore the code. This is how it works, right? <laughs> That's not a good sign. It means your code is hard to read. It means your code is hard to understand, right? Right. And Python is famous for like readable code. Um, but you can make it not readable. And you can write code that maybe it's readable because you use a for loop and people know what that means, but like no one has a clue why it works. Um, so like th using this way is kind of leads you to like describing what your program does sort of in terms of verbs and nouns, the way that you might do it in English. And so your code kind of tends to look like a specification. Like the boss says, I want it to, you know, give me the top 20 people whose eyes are blue, sort of by last name. I can write code that almost says that ex exactly, just as you <laughs> said that. That's extremely obvious. You can look at that code. You may not know exactly how it does it behind the scenes, but you know what it does. And that's really important <coughs> with code. And you can always dive in and learn more as, you, as you're debugging it. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't have any bugs. But I think that fundamentally the idea of like having your code describe what your code is doing uh, in sort of plain terms mm -hmm. is probably the most compelling reason, I think. Uh, also, the idea of composition. Uh, if you write things compositionally, if you like kind of become good at that, then your code tends, you tend to write a lot less of it. Because your functions can be reused in so many places that eventually you just, I mean, this never happens, but eventually you stop writing functions. Like, I have, I have a whole library of all the things I could ever want. I can just stick them together, and it's like puzzles, it's like Legos. It's no longer like, man, how am I going to do this? It's like, oh, I got this, stick it with that, put this on top, done. Right? That's the idea of composition. A lot of functions, especially if they're doing effects, if they're not, if they're not deterministic, they could be, they could have been compositional if they were written differently. But because they are like baked into like how they interact with files, I can almost use your function, but I can't quite. So I have to write it again. Do you find that you write more functions that are much smaller than you used? Oh yes, yeah. You tend to write a lot of functions that are very small. If you look at this file, you know this might be like the largest function. Well, actually, this one line. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so like here's probably the largest function in this whole file. If you, look, if you look through this file, I'll post this on the meeting. You know, oh, actually, this is actually probably the longest. Uh, you know, most of your functions are very small, but they sort of represent like parts of a sentence. You know, that you can kind of piece the sentence together and they still work. So yeah, you write a lot of small functions this way. Do you ever uh, write like a dictionary of functions and call them? Uh, that way with the keywords, like I showed you with objects. It, like was that the uh, the class example? Yeah. Okay. Because I've I've heard of like simulating switches that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do pattern matching that way. Yeah, you can do a lot of cool things. Uh, if you've ever used JavaScript, that's a f JavaScript is effectively that, right? Yeah. They just have pretty syntax for for lookups in dictionary. Objects are nothing more than dictionaries in JavaScript. So if you're using JavaScript, that's actually what you're doing. Because in Python, you're not, you're almost doing that, but not quite. Um, yeah. So any other questions, thoughts? Wrap it up. All right. Thank you guys very much.